Perfect. What's up, y'all? Good morning, good morning, good morning. Uh, I'm excited to be here. Like Joel said, I've been uh, knowing him since, man, literally probably 16. And he used to drag me to Bible study. I'd be like, bro, I ain't trying to go, man. <laughs> and he'd keep bringing me and be consistent. Uh, and, and him and other men's consistent presence in my life is what uh, has me here today in the ministry that I'm doing. And, and I, I thank the Lord Jesus that this brother is still on fire that he's still passionate about winning souls. He's still passionate about bringing people into the kingdom of God. Uh, and you guys are blessed with a, a, a pastor who truly loves the Lord, truly loves uh, his people. Amen. Uh, so as he said, my name is Olayinka Obasanya. That's my full proper Yoruba name. Uh, and as you can see there in the front row, that's my lovely wife, Crystal Obasanya. She is also, she's now Yoruba by marriage, eh? but she's traditionally Igbo uh, by culture. So I'm excited to get into the word today. I have a lot to share, a lot that's, that's been on my heart, uh, especially about the topic that we're going to be talking about. So, you know, dig in. I'm coming for y'all. I'm coming for the church. I'm coming for everybody with this sermon because uh, it's real. <laughs> It's real. This thing that we're talking about is very real. So we're going to go ahead and um, get started here in a little bit. Um, if you guys can bow your head with me for prayer, I'm going to pray before we get started and jump, jump in. Yes, Lord, we thank you. 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 We thank you, God, that you are present. We thank you, God, that you chose to go on that cross and die on our behalf. And you were resurrected three days later, God. And because of your sacrifice, we have salvation in you. So I pray, Lord, as I preach your word, as I talk about your goodness, God, would you come and speak through me? Would you come prepare the hearts and the ears in the room tonight? And we just ask, Lord, that you would have your way this morning. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Real quick, just real quick before uh, I, I jump into it. So a little bit about me. Uh, I started a campus ministry called FaceTime with God on Baylor University's campus. I did that for about uh, five years, six years, seven years. Um, and I also do college ministry across uh, Texas. I was in Waco. I was working at a church doing that. And let me just tell you, you know, uh, I love getting to work with this next generation of people coming up because especially in the ministry I was doing in college ministry, we have people coming from all over the nation, all over the world, and they're getting sent back out to, to uh, love people the way Jesus does. So it's been an honor and a pleasure to get to do ministry in that regard. Uh, I also got to go to a seminary along the way, and I've gotten to uh, just come under a lot of great men of God who've taught me uh, how to not be a fool in this ministry thing. Amen. Because Lord, Lord, no, I still got some fool in me, but he's getting it out in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, but, but today I want to talk about, here's the topic I want to talk about. I want to talk about Jesus and the Pharisees. So if you're a note taker, uh, that's going to be the sermon title, Jesus and the Pharisee. And the reason why I've been fascinated with this topic the past couple years is because, you know, Jesus had a lot of different encounters with a lot of different kinds of people over the years of his ministry, right? He, he, he met with the rich. He, he met with the poor. He met with the, the broken. He met with uh, tax collectors. He met with... Uh, um, religious people. He met with uh, sinners. He met with adulterers. He had encounters with all of these different kinds of people. Uh, 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 rich, poor, Jews, Sumerians, all of these different kinds of people. But there is no encounter that he has with people like he has with the Pharisees. His encounter with the Pharisees is like no other encounters he has in, in the whole scope of his ministry. 
And that is fascinating me because I wonder why is it that whenever Jesus comes in the presence of a Pharisee, whenever he's talking to Pharisees, there's this volatility around their conversation. What, what is it about the Pharisees that brings what it brings out of Jesus? Also, I want y'all to know, I'm a, I, I, I'm a talk back kind of guy. So, so feel free. I'm just throwing it out there. Y'all can talk back to me. I won't get offended. I promise. All right? <laughs> Jesus and the Pharisee. What is it about Jesus and the Pharisee? So let's talk about who the Pharisees were. Like many of us, we, we, we hear the term Pharisee, and we really don't really know who that is or, or what they are. So the, the Pharisees were, were a, a sect of Jews that lived in Israel in ancient times. So they uh, were, let's, let's just, you know, let's just say there were <laughs> different gangs <laughs> in the Jewish culture, or for better uh, wording, denominations, okay, in the Jewish culture at that time. So you got the Sadducees, you know, who, who were more high class they uh, didn't believe that the resurrection happened. You have the Pharisees, uh, you have the Essenes, you have the Zealots. The Zealots, they were just trying to turn everything over. They just wanted to overthrow the government. They didn't care. So you have these four main groups, and out of those four main groups, the Pharisees are the most influential, they're the most powerful, uh, they have the most social capital in, in ancient uh, Israel at the time. And they're a particular sect. And when you look at their theology and the way they think and, and the way they approach Scripture, you actually see a lot of similarities with what Jesus preached. Amen? So let's look at who the Pharisees were. The Pharisees, at the age of four, would begin to memorize Genesis and Leviticus. What were you doing at four? <laughs> what are kids today doing at four? They're watching Baby Shark. Do, 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 do. Imagine those same children. And no, imagine them. Right, they, they love that Baby Shark. They, instead, <laughs> instead the, the Pharisee children were learning about uh, uh, Adam and Eve, and, and, and they were memorizing Leviticus. I don't who reads, even reads Leviticus? No, it's like they were memorizing Leviticus at the age of four. By the age of 12, they were on their way to memorizing the entire Torah. A huge chunk of the, the Old Testament. These Pharisees, they knew their word. They were very committed to the word of God. Because I think when we talk about the Pharisees, we think, oh, they're just hypocrites. They didn't do anything. No, they knew the word very well. Very well. You think you know the, the Bible because you, you, you did a, a verse of the week? Pharisee will laugh at you. <laughs> That's cute. You're learning one verse a week? I did that in, in, in one minute. These are the Pharisees. The Pharisees prayed. They prayed a lot. You thought your, your, your African mom prayed? She hasn't met a Pharisee. <laughs> These Pharisees, they prayed vigorously. They prayed all day and all night. These Pharisees, they fasted. In fact, you know, I know a lot of us, we do six to six fast. The Pharisees would laugh at you. Six to six? I'm fasting days straight, bruh. I ain't got no water. <laughs> no water fast. And, they, and you would see it on their face too because they'd be like, what's wrong? Pharisee John, what's wrong with you? I'm fasting five days, <laughs> no water, no food, nothing. <laughs> and that's how they would carry themselves. They, 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 they were committed to the law of God. They knew the law 
back and forth. The Pharisees were committed to the word. And think about it. We just talked about the word. What does the Bible say? That the word of God is alive. It's like a double-edged word. So it's a good thing to know the word, right? Uh, the Pharisees prayed. The word says pray without ceasing. So that's a good thing, right? The, the, the word says that some things only come out through prayer and fasting. And they fasted. That's a good thing, right? But no, every time Jesus encounters these people, there is a volatile encounter. And it makes you wonder, but these are the people doing it right. He's not talking to the, to the, to the adulterer like this. He's not talking to the, to the sinner and the tax collector like this. But when he comes to the Pharisees, people who, who, who Jesus would actually theologically align with in most regards, it's those people that Jesus has the harshest words to say to. So I know you guys think I'm just talking, so let me actually show you some of the things Jesus would say to them. Matthew 16. If you guys can open with me to Matthew uh, 16. And I'll start at uh, verse 1. <clears throat> And the Pharisees and Sadducees came, and to test him, they asked him to show them a sign from heaven. He answered them, When it is evening, you say it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, it will be stormy today, for the sky is red and threatening. You know how to interpret the appearance of the sky, but you cannot interpret the signs of the times. An evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the shine of Jonah. Then he mic drops and dips out. You keep reading. After Jesus says that to them, he's now with the disciples. And the disciples, when, when they reach the other side, I'm in verse 5 now. When the disciples reached the other side, they had forgotten to bring any bread. And Jesus said to them, watch and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. And listen to what the disciples say. This is the stuff that makes me, I don't know how Jesus wasn't constantly slapping them on the back of the head. This is, the, this is what they respond. And they began discussing it among themselves, like, John, Peter, but we don't have bread. They said, but we brought no bread. They, they think what Jesus is talking about is bread, wonder bread. <laughs> they think that's what Jesus is talking about. But listen to him. But Jesus, aware of this, said, oh, you of little faith, why are you discussing amongst yourselves the fact that you have no bread? Do you not yet perceive? Do you not remember the five loaves for the 5,000 and how many baskets you gathered? Or, or the seven loaves for the 4,000 and how many baskets you gathered? How is it that you fail to understand that I do not speak about bread? Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Jesus is saying it's not about bread. Y'all the same ones who just saw us feed 5,000. The same people who just saw me feed 4,000 with five loaves of bread, with seven loaves of bread. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about leaven of the Pharisees. Now, what, what is leaven? Many, maybe maybe uh, we read this and we don't understand what leaven is. Leaven is an agent that you put into bread, uh, you put into grain that helps the bread rise, right? So, so even the bread we eat, it, it, it's through leavening that it's puffy and, you know, it's bigger, right? But typically it's very flat, okay? So you put the leavening agent into it that makes it grow bigger and it makes it uh, spread and, 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 and grow wider. And when he's talking about the leaven of the Pharisees, he's not talking about their ability to make bread. <laughs> he's talking about their teaching. He's talking about their orthodoxy and the way that they teach the word. But, but again, 
remember I said that Jesus and the Pharisees, they have similar theologies. So, so the way they approach the word is actually similar, but let's go to Matthew 23. Now, I, uh, <laughs> I grew up listening to rap, okay? So I don't know if anybody else here in, in here can, can relate, grew up listening to rap, but I grew up listening to rap, uh, and there was a uh, rap battle that happened in the early 2000s between Jay-Z and Nas, okay? So these are the two biggest rappers out of New York at the time, and, and they're having this rap battle. I don't know why they, they had it. Rap battles just tend to happen, and there's this beef. And our, but anyway, they had this beef. Jay-Z put out a song like, nah, 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 your mother, man. <laughs> Nas had a response like, nah, 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 nah. And then Jay-Z responded, and they were going back and forth. And then, and then finally, Nas drops this song called Ether. Now, I can't re recommend you listening from this pulpit, so don't... <laughs> I'm just putting that out there, okay? I'm not, going, I'm, not, I'm not glorifying it. I'm just letting you know what it was. Nas puts out this song called Ether, and, and in this song, he comes for Jay-Z's entire life. Like he finishes the guy from start to finish. And, and this song becomes so popular that the song title Ether becomes a, a, a verb people started using. Like if you beat somebody in basketball, I just ethered you, bro. You know, if you win a rap battle, if you win a, some kind of competition, you just got ethered. That's how big this song was. And this, ver this passage in, in, in Matthew uh, 23, this is Jesus ether to the Pharisees right here. This is Jesus ether where he's going completely in. And this is going to uh, 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 help us understand why Jesus came at the Pharisees the way he did. Why Jesus came to the people who are the most religious in the land, the ones who prayed the most, the ones who fasted the most, the ones who, who, who did the, the most in the temple. Why did Jesus come for them? That's the question we're trying to answer today. And Jesus is going to help us answer it. And we're going to start in verse, uh, verse 1. Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, the scribes and the Pharisees, they sit on Moses' seat. They so do and observe whatever they tell you, but not the works. So, he, uh, sorry, in verse 3. So do and observe whatever they tell you, but not the works they do. For they preach, but do not practice. Do and observe what they tell you, but not the works they do. He's saying their orthodoxy, right? In seminary, we learned this word, orthodoxy. Ortho simply means right or correct, and then doxy simply means teaching or doctrine. He says they have right teaching, so you can listen to what they teach, but don't follow what they do. Their orthopraxy, which is how they actually practice what they teach, don't follow that because the two are incongruent. The two don't line up together. So, so he says, follow what they preach, but do not follow what they practice. Now, if we look at what they practice, well, aren't they the ones praying? Aren't they the ones fasting? Aren't they the ones doing all these religious things? But it's the heart behind what they're doing. They're puffed up in their spirit. They're puffed up with pride. How many of us have been in church circles where we've been told all these things from the front, but something doesn't connect with us because there's pride in the way that it's being communicated? Somewhere along the line in our churches and in our religious circles, it became about how holy we are and we forgot it was about how holy he is. It's never been about our holiness. And the reason Jesus is so upset is because they put these heavy burdens on people that they have to have it all together to obtain the favor of God. And you know, it hasn't been till recently that I started having that same frustration because I'm, I'm seeing my friends turn from the faith. And I get it. Yeah, they have, everyone has their own decision to make in life. We all have our own choices. I get that part. 
But it's heartbreaking to see my friends turn from God because of religion. The very thing that's supposed to bring people into the loving arms of Jesus is tearing people away from him. So why wouldn't Jesus be so upset? Why wouldn't he call them a brood of vipers? Let's keep reading. He says in verse 4, they tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and they lay them on people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to move with their finger. They do all their deeds to be seen by others, for they make their phylacteries broad and their fringes long, and they love the place of honor at feast and the best seats in the synagogue. And they love greetings in the marketplace and being called rabbi to others. But you are not to be called rabbi, for you have one teacher, and you are all brothers. And call no man your father on earth, for you have one father who is in heaven. Neither be called instructors, for you have one instructor, the Christ. The greatest amongst you shall be your servant. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut the kingdom of heaven in people's faces, for you neither enter yourselves nor allow those who would enter to go in. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, for you travel across sea and land to make a single proselyte or, or, or convert. And when he becomes a, a, a convert, you make him twice as much a child of hell as yourselves. This is Jesus talking. He's going in, y'all. Woe to you blind guides who say, if anyone swears by the temple, it is nothing. But if anyone swears by the gold of the temple, he is bound by his oath. You blind fools, for which is greater, the gold or the temple that has been made has made the gold sacred. And you say, if anyone swears by the altar, it is nothing. But if anyone swears by the gift that is on the altar, he is bound by his oath. You blind men, for which is greater, the gift or the altar that makes the gift sacred? So whoever swears by the altar swears by it and by everything on it. And whoever swears by it, the temple swears by it and by him who dwells in. And whoever swears by heaven swears by the throne of God and by him who sits upon it. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tied mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. You blind go, go oh my gosh, this is reading, I'm even, I'm, I'm shook, <laughs> I'm shook. You blind guides, straining out a gnat and swallowing a camel. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you clean the outside of the cup and the plate, but inside, hmm. You, you, in other words, you wear your church clothes on Sunday, and you say, hallelujah, praise God, blessed and highly favored, amen. But inside, it's hatred, it's jealousy, it's greed. You blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and the plate that the outside also may be clean. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs which outwardly appear beautiful, you got your worship posture down, you know? You look so pretty when you worship. Oh, oh, oh you know, yes, God. Yes, Lord, I give it all to you. <laughs> Lord, I give it all to you. My, and then after church, <laughs> beep, like move out of my, you have row rage as soon as you leave this building. The next day on Monday, you're fighting all your co-workers. They better not talk to me today. I don't got time. 
They are going to catch all of these hands if they keep coming to me trying to tell me what to do. I don't even need to be here. Period. Period. <laughs> you hear my wife? We are, we are still getting holy. We are still being sanctified. Amen. <laughs> says so you also outwardly appear righteous to others but within you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness I can keep on reading and reading and reading and reading but I think we get the point and I would encourage you to, to just just really dive into this Matthew 23 in your own time because yes there's a lot of people you know, when I first read, started reading this, thing, I was like, okay, I can think of, yeah, you need to read this. Yeah, no, she definitely needs to read this. Uh, yeah, pastor need to read this one too. But then the more you read it, start looking like, I need this. I need to hear these rebukes again. Because the Pharisee is not just outside. It's in me too. I started thinking back to all the times because I wanted my, my, my friends to know Jesus. I, I, I just taught them religion. I didn't, I didn't bring them to the word. I didn't bring them to, I said, no, no, just stop, stop having sex with her, man. No, just move out, just move out. That became my focus, man, just, just stop getting drunk all the time. My focus became their actions. My focus became behavior modification, but it didn't become showing them the person of Jesus. How many times have we showed people religion instead of Jesus, as if Jesus isn't the one who makes us holy? It's him. I'm telling you, because when you have an encounter with Jesus, everything changes. Everything changes. In so many of our churches, we, 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 we've made these rules up that it's like, where did these rules even come from? Jesus made it simple. He says, there's one instructor, and it's me. <laughs> he says, there's one rabbi, and it's me. And don't get it twisted. The standard... For, for the believer, the son of God, the child of God, is infinitely higher than the Pharisee. But the standard is higher because it's the holiness of God inside of us. It's not our own strength. It's not our own holiness. Amen. Amen. Matthew 5, I'll read. He says, and when you pray, you must not like, be like the hypocrites. I'm in verse, I'm sorry, I'm uh, actually Matthew 6. He says, and when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may seem by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. Their reward is the praise of man, by the way. But when you go, pray into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret and your father who sees in secret will reward you. If uh, your prayer closet hasn't seen your niece in years but the church walls have heard your prayer shouts every Sunday, then there's an issue. Our, our, our prayer closet, that vulnerable place where we come to him, where we build communion with him. That's what he's talking about when he's talking about pray without ceasing. I'm not saying don't pray in church. Obviously, we pray in church. But, but if that's our focus, oh, I, I have to pray. Everybody else around me is praying, so I'm going to just do it. Uh, I encourage y'all to read Acts. <laughs> Go read what happened to uh, uh, Adonis and Sapphira. Hey, it's scary because 
in the verse in the chapter previous, everyone is giving their houses because that's just the thing that's happening. Everyone's giving their houses, everyone's giving, and they try to give their house, but they only give a portion of it and they keep some for themselves because they were doing it for the show and, and they get struck dead. God strikes them down because they were doing it for show. The, the, what Jesus is trying to get across is that our temple is not these four walls. Our temple is right here. Amen. So this is how he tells them to pray. He says, our father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. He says in, in verse 16, and when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces, that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly I said they have received their reward. And what's their reward? The opinion of men. But when you fast, anoint your head, wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by others but by your father who is in secret, and your father who sees in secret will reward you. In verse one, beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them, for then you will have no reward from your father who is in heaven. Thus, when you give to the needy, when you give to the poor, you don't have to record it and put it on the gram. Sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrites in the synagogues and the streets do. They, that they, they may be praised by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. Jesus gives the, the, the remedy to what the Pharisees have, have put on the people in these, in these passages. He says, this is how you ought to live. You ought to live in a way that is holy to me not to be seen by others, not because it gives you social status in Christian circles. You get your little Christian badge and you cool. No, because you made me the king of your heart. You've made me the Lord of your life in here before you did it out there. And I'm telling you, when, when we get a, a, a bunch of believers who are living their lives like that, we're going to see the church operating in its full power again. People, you talk about evangelicalism today, the church, whatever phrase you want to use for it, people laughing. I had a, <laughs> I had a uh, when I was doing campus ministry, I had a, a girl from China come, and she was doing a study on the church. And she thought, she thought that the church was just uh, Trump supporters. <laughs> she thought that was like the whole of what church is. It's just, oh, they, they're just people who, who, who support Trump. You talk to other people in different parts of the world, they'll tell you, oh, they just, they just have great rules. You know, they just, they don't, they don't, uh, they don't drink, <laughs> you know, or, or whatever, the, whatever the thing is. We need people to know us again for Christ, to know us again for our love for Jesus, not for what we're against. There's a million and one things to be against in this world, but the true believers, the, 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 the powerful church is known for what they're for, and what we're for is Jesus Christ in every single aspect of our lives. Amen? So I'm going to go ahead and round up, and I want to read a passage in uh, Hebrews 10. Um, let's do, let's do uh, verse 14. I'll go from verse 14 to like, let's say, uh, let's say 19, okay. So I'll read, 
It says, for by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. I'm going to read that, that verse again before we go forward. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. That means that there is not this striving for perfection that we're supposed to, to just strive. I, gotta, oh, I need to be perfect. I need to get everything right. We've already been made perfect by his one sacrifice. And we're walking in that perfection day by day by day with him, saying, Jesus, help me. Help me to walk and to, to smell like you, to look like you, to talk like you. Every day we're coming before him with full awareness of our brokenness and we're bringing it before Jesus and we're saying, Jesus, it's all yours. Every morning when we wake up and every night when we go to sleep, we're bringing our brokenness before him so that he can make us look like him. For by one sacrifice, we have been made perfect. So the pressure isn't on us. I messed up today. Oh my gosh. How am I going to go to God today? Oh my goodness. Oh no, 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 no. Oh, no. That's honestly why a lot of people turn from the faith. That's, uh, uh, truly, they make a mistake. They think, oh, God ain't trying to deal with me. Nah, not me. But all the mess I got going on, let me just, let me just live my life sinfully and happily. <laughs> because he ain't trying to have anything to do with me. I'm way too broken for him. Not knowing that the beauty is in the brokenness. That's where the redemption comes in. That's where his salvation comes in. It's for one offering he has made perfect for all time, those who are being sanctified. And we're being sanctified every day. And it says, and the Holy Spirit also bears witness to us. For after saying, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws on their hearts and write them on their minds. Then he adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain that is through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Amen. So what are we choosing today? And the worship team, feel free to come up. What are we choosing? Are we, are we choosing the way of the Pharisee? Or are we choosing the way of Jesus? It's, it's very easy. Like, let me tell you guys, this is something even today I'm still struggling, I still struggle with. I'm still like, man, God, help me to not make it about what it's not. Help me to make you the first person each and every day. That's still something I'm, I'm personally fighting to do more of. So let us make that decision. Let us be those people. Let the church get its power back, man. How the church got its groove back. Let's make that a movie. <laughs> it starts with Jesus, though. And I love, man, what, what y'all are doing in here you know, just, just being in here this, this morning for worship, you know, uh, even before worship, everybody is moving around. Everybody's making things happen, you know, and, and, and y'all are not here because you're forced to be. Y'all are here because you want to be. And I think the city of Houston needs that. I think the city of Houston needs that. Thank you, our, our sisters leading us in worship. That was powerful. These, these times with God, these encounters, they help us to walk purely with him and see his power in our lives. Amen?
So I'm going to go ahead and pray and uh, worship, and then go from there. Lord, we, we thank you. We, we give you the, the glory. We give you the adoration because it was by your sacrifice that we're even worthy of being in this place right now, God. Because we don't deserve your goodness. We, we couldn't possibly live up to the standard. But you still saw us fit. You still saw us fit to, 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 to enter into your presence. Thank you for being so kind. Thank you for your grace and your mercy and your love. And I pray if anyone came in here this morning feeling shame and feeling guilt, I pray, Lord, that you would redeem them from that shame and guilt, God. That they would know your grace that empowers us to walk how you've called us to walk that they would know your love, that they would know your mercy. In the name of Jesus, each and every one of us, God, help us to walk closely with you, God, to, to not fall back on religion when it becomes easy, but to depend on your Holy Spirit, to walk in step with your Holy Spirit, as it says in Galatians that we may begin to see the fruit of the Spirit naturally come out of our lives, that we wouldn't feel like we have to force these fruits. The, 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 the fruits, they naturally grow as we walk with you. So help us to walk with you, Lord. Be in this room as we worship God. Join us and hear our sacrifice. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.